Our castaway this week is a very celebrated American jazz star, a man who's probably caused more controversy than any other jazz musician since the war. I'm welcoming ashore Dave Brubeck. Hello. But Dave, this isn't your first visit to Britain, is it? No, it isn't. I was here once during the war, and then I was here on my last tour about a year ago, and of course this is the third time. Yes. Will it be your first visit to a desert island? Yes, definitely. <laughs> what would be your reaction to solitude? Could you take it? Well, I've been alone a lot in my life, uh, being raised on a huge 45,000-acre cattle ranch, and I always kind of liked it. Mm -hmm. 45,000 acres, something we can't envisage over here. <laughs> now, you have those eight discs. What tests did you apply in choosing them? What qualities were you looking for? Well, uh, in choosing the eight discs, I think I chose the ones that were the most important to me in my development as a musician. Mm -hmm. And uh, they have the qualities that I like the best in music, the emotional quality. What's the first one? The first one is the Brandenburg Concerto Number no. 2 in F major. Why do you choose this? Well, this is the recording that I like to put on at home uh, in the morning. It's very good wake-up music. It's kind of like a, a third cup of coffee. <laughs> uh, this is the one with the trumpet in Right, the F trumpet. Part of the third movement of Bach's second Brandenburg Concerto, played by the Stuttgart Chamber Orchestra, conducted by Karl Munchika. Now, what's your second choice? Well, I would choose Cottontail by the Duke Ellington Orchestra mm -hmm. because this was, to me, the, the greatest orchestra in jazz, and Duke is my favorite jazz composer, and he's still my favorite uh, jazz band, big band. But this particular recording struck me when I was quite young, and it, it opened my eyes to a possibility of polytonality. Later on, I found out that uh, it wasn't conceived with the idea of two keys, but when I heard it, I heard it in two keys, and it, it opened a lot of doors for my future development. Duke Ellington and his orchestra, a 1940 recording of Cottontail. Dave, whereabouts in the United States do you come from? Where was that 45,000-acre cattle ranch? Well, that was in Northern California. I was born quite near there. Yeah. Were and your parents musical? Well, my father was a cattleman. My mother was a, a musician, which was a very odd combination. She came here to London to study with Tobias Mate mm -hmm. in 1926. At what age did you start taking an interest in music yourself? Well, I was about four, I guess. I started the piano with my mother and started composing quite, quite young. When did the idea first hit you that you were going to make music your career? Well, it didn't actually uh, seem that way until my second year of college mm -hmm. because I had gone to school as a veterinarian major and uh, then I switched to music the second year. Yes. What was your first professional engagement? Did you take any, any jobs while you were still studying? Well, I was 14 when I started working with dance bands up in this hill country. They were very uh, odd type of bands, kind of western and swing, all mixed up. And then uh, I worked in college, sometimes six nights a week in what we call nightclubs, and uh, worked my way through school, mm -hmm. playing in, in jobs. Oh, you mentioned you had a, a brief visit to, uh, to Britain when you were in the Army. Did you have any chance to make music? In the Army, uh, I enlisted as a musician, but when we became short of men, uh, they uh, took all the bandsmen and put us in the infantry. So I came over to uh, the European front as a rifleman replacement, and uh, I was at Metz when we were all stopped there. And uh, some girls in a Red Cross unit came up to the audience if there was a pianist. And I remember scrambling over the tops of <laughs> all the GIs to get up to the piano. I hadn't touched one for months. Yeah. So the officers the next day our group was shipping out to the front. It, uh, they came right up to the uh, our unit and asked for me to stay behind, which was a fortunate thing because uh, most of those fellows didn't get back. Mm -hmm. And when you left the service, what happened? Well, then I studied on the GI Bill with uh, Darius Meal, the French composer, at Mills College in Oakland, California. Mm -hmm. 
Well, I think at this point we ought to break off and have another record. What's number three? Number three, uh, Tiger Rag of Art Tatum. Ah, yes. Uh, Art Tatum is my favorite, a jazz pianist, and I think he always will be. He, he could play faster, as you'll hear on this recording, uh, than anyone. He had a tremendous harmonic and rhythmic sense, and he was my inspiration when I was starting jazz. Art Tatum's Tiger Rag. Well, after your war service, Dave, you went to study with Darius Milo. Did you at any time contemplate a career in classical music? Uh, as a composer, yes, I did, but uh, Mio, of all people, uh, said I must stick in jazz, that uh, why should I give up something that I could do and just become a copy of uh, the Western European type composer, which yeah. I at that time wanted to do. Yeah. He was very sympathetic to jazz. Very sympathetic, and he encouraged all of us, uh, all the jazz musicians in that area. Mm -hmm. You were still at college when you formed your octet. Right. We were all students of Mio yes. at the time. Not all, five of the eight. And uh, for our homework, uh, when he assigned us to, to write different compositions, uh, we decided, well, we'll write for the, the jazz musicians in the class. Mm. And many of the first octet uh, recordings were actually homework for Mio's class, like the fugues of David Van Creek, which are absolutely strict fugues. Yes. And, and the octet made quite a lot of recordings at that time. Well, the, the ones that released are actually uh, concerts at Mills College, mm. where there was a home recorder, and we finally just decided to release these things. Yes. The octet didn't last very long, did it? We lasted for four years. We have a record without a job. <laughs> <laughs> we did just maybe three or four concerts in the whole time. Yes. When they talk about starving musicians, we hold a record. <laughs> <laughs> These records you were making um, on the West Coast began to receive nationwide publicity, and soon you, you found yourself a very celebrated and, and controversial figure. But I think before we talk about your big success, we'd better have another record. Let's have number four. Well, I chose here the Debussy String Quartet. Now... I like this so much because I see a great similarity between jazz and uh, classical music that I've never seen compared before. And I think more and more people are going to re realize the tremendous uh, relationship between all music uh, and not be saying this is jazz or this is uh, classical. In this movement I've chosen, there's a typically African rhythmic beat and almost melodically, it's very much like uh, recordings I've heard from Africa. Part of the Debussy String Quartet, the part of the second movement played by the Löwengut Quartet of Paris. Dave, you've been talked of as leader of an esoteric school, that you're out on your own right away from the mainstream, making your own kind of private jazz. Is that a fair comment? No, I, I don't think so. And... Uh, I think the things that we're doing now are out on our own, but I think they have their roots in jazz, and maybe more so than most of the things they consider mainstream. After all, uh, the work songs, the field cries of the early Negro, uh, I know, I can prove, we're in 5-4. Well, has anybody used 5-4 in jazz? Rarely. So we come over here and play a 5-4 piece, and they say it isn't jazz. Mm. I don't think they know uh, the tremendous rhythmical uh, uh, music of Africa, which is supposed to be the rhythmical root of jazz, how we've been neglecting this all along. Mm. So it, if it doesn't sound in 2-4 or 4-4, four, four, they say it isn't jazz. I say it, it might have more traditional jazz in it than they think. Mm -hmm. The basis of your work, of course, is improvisation. Yes, and I think this is the great contribution of jazz, the freedom to improvise. Uh, when it's written, I consider it composition. Uh, that's the way I work. And when it's uh, improvised and free, uh, I consider it more as jazz should be. Mm -hmm. Well, let's have record number five. What's that going to be? Well, this is a, an excellent example of composition uh, and jazz. In fact, it's uh, the problem that I'm going to confront the rest of my life, and I'd like to have this record on the desert island because it is the first 
time, to my knowledge, where composition and jazz has have come together. Darius Meal's creation of the world, and I think the best time that they've ever come together. Uh, Bernstein conducting this, too, is my favorite because he has a feeling for this rhythmic type of music. Part of Darius Mio's The Creation of the World, conducted by Leonard Bernstein. Dave, you're over here with your quartet. How long have you been playing together? Well, Paul Desmond uh, and I have been playing together off and on since 1946. Mm -hmm. He was with the original octet. Then steadily we've been playing with the quartet since 1951. Yeah. It's incredible the way you all think alike in those very intricate improvisations you get into. I mean, you go so, so uh, go out so wide, you, you need a good mathematical brain to get back. <laughs> well, it helps playing together all these years, and of course Joe Morello, our drummer, has been with us going on four years, and yes. Eugene Wright on bass, two years. Mm -hmm. You're you're a very successful man, Dave. Is there any ambition you have which still isn't realized? Well, uh, you know, I, I started out with a, f a few ideas that I haven't realized yet, and I don't think when I'm through writing, dead, so to speak, <laughs> that I will have attained them at all. But I haven't changed in my ideas so that I can see I'm closer to them. I wanted to play uh, polyrhythmic jazz and polytonal jazz, and mm -hmm. I'm still working all these years trying to do it, trying to get uh, other musicians to do it with, with me. Uh, and our next LP, called Time Out, will be the closest I've come to that. Fine. There is progress. There is progress. <laughs> <laughs> let's have record number six. Well, let's uh, have Mahalia Jackson's uh, Didn't It Rain from the Newport 1958 Festival. Uh, this would help me bring Newport and all my years of playing there and all my association with the jazz musicians to the island but uh, it would be great to have Mahalia's voice there because it's so moving uh, the Negro spiritual is to me perhaps the most moving music in the world and her voice I would say one of the greatest Mahalia Jackson singing didn't it rain Dave, you're now required to pass an examination on your practical qualifications as a desert island castaway. Could you build a house of some sort to live in? Yes, I think out of logs I could. Mm -hmm. I've tried that before, and it was a very primitive success. But it stayed up. <laughs> yes. That's the main thing. Could you get food? You I enough? know I could get food if I uh, could fish or look for shellfish or crabs. Yes. Having got it, could you cook it? Yes, if I could build a fire, and I recall a few ways that you're supposed to be able to build a fire. <laughs> yes, I hope they work. Now, suppose uh, you've been on this island for some time, you're able to build a rough craft of some sort, you'd have no navigating instruments and you wouldn't know exactly where you were. Now, would you try to escape or would you stay put? Well, it depends on the island. I've read Contiki. <laughs> There's <laughs> ways of getting out uh, if the tides are right. But I, I think I'd be inclined to stick with the island. Mm -hmm. All right, let's have your seventh record to play while you're there. Well, I would choose uh, Shostakovich, Fifth Symphony. Now, he's not my favorite composer. I, I will not be having Bartok with me or Stravinsky, but I chose this because of the theme being a very important theme to me, and I would want to be composing on this desert island. Would you allow me manuscript paper? Uh, well, not officially. I don't know what you'd uh, have with you in your pocket, so whether you could manage on tree bark and squid ink, but <laughs> anyway, I'm quite sure you'd find a way to keep Well, composing. this is a very important theme for me to have with me, the Shostakovich fit. Part of the first movement of the Shostakovich Fifth Symphony played by the Philharmonic Symphony Orchestra of London, conducted by Artur Rodzinski. Well, now we come to your last disc, Dave. You haven't chosen any of your own music yet. No, and I, I don't intend to either. <laughs> the, uh, the reason for that is um, my mind would be like uh, my own recordings. I can remember those. Mm. wouldn't want to waste uh, <laughs> my right. final choice. What is your final choice? Oh, it would be the Beethoven Ninth Symphony, the Ode to Joy. I think this is the most powerful piece of music ever written. 
and I would want that definitely with me. The closing passage of Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, Herbert von Karajan conducting our Philharmonia Orchestra of London and the Friends of Music Chorus of Vienna and soloists. Well, Dave, where are you off to when you leave Britain? Well, we go to Italy for three days and then over the pole to San Francisco. That's your home. Right. Well, now, as well as the eight records you'll have on this island, you're also allowed one luxury. Yes, and I would choose the piano. I thought you might. <laughs> and one book? Oh, uh, an encyclopedia of facts of world that goes back as far as recorded history up to the present and into the future, so I could manage on this island. All right. And thank you, Dave Brubeck, for letting us hear your choice of Desert Island Discs.